video is not there. Uh, a very good uh, evening to all the viewers uh, of the YouTube channel of Bengal Institute of Political Studies. Uh, I am Deptanu Maji. Uh, today I have uh, got with myself uh, Professor R. Radhakrishnan. Uh, he is the assistant professor, Symbiosis Law School, Hyderabad, Telangana. And uh, today we will be uh, discussing on India's foreign policy from a post colonial state to an aspiring uh, global power. So uh, I uh, welcome uh, you, Professor R. Radhakrishnan, uh, to, this, uh, to the YouTube channel of Bengal Institute of Political uh, Studies. Uh, and uh, now uh, we'll uh, come to the topic of our discussion. So uh, my first question uh, to you will be, uh, what is the uh, qualitative shift in India's approach uh, in its uh, foreign policy? Uh, if you uh, if you can uh, explain it uh, since uh, independence. So now it is uh, over to you. Yeah. Good evening, uh, Professor Dev Tanu, and I take this opportunity to thank Bips for having me here. Firstly, uh, when you had raised this question about the qualitative shift. There has been a qualitative shift in terms of moving away from the state of idealism. One could also say a state of blissful ignorance to a realistic approach where we take our national interests and concerns into account. And this shift had happened in the post Nehruvian era. To be fair, uh, leaders after Lal Bahadur Shastri were very categorical. They realized a shift in the emerging world order. They also took into account India's national interest and security into concern. Primarily, when, you, when we look at it, we also realize that South Asia was in turmoil during the Indira Gandhi era, as well as in Rajiv Gandhi era. Thereafter, there has been a qualitative shift. Economics comes, uh, assumes importance, then you have deployment of soft power as a very important tool in foreign policy. And apart from very uh, multilateral approaches. Yes, yes please. Yeah. Uh, so uh, now uh, if you see uh, that uh, uh, after independence, uh, India's, uh, India uh, faced some problems uh, as, a, uh, 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 as a newly born state. Uh, so uh, those internal problems also uh, had a had an influence in our foreign policy. Uh, so if you can just uh, highlight uh, on those uh, problems, what were the problems uh, India was facing uh, just after independence? Certainly, uh, it's a very uh, appropriate question in the sense that people used to wonder uh, what was India. There were many scholars who were debating about the idea of India in terms of uh, what should be the basis on the which on which the on which India as a nation state should exist. After all, you know it's a big jolt. After two hundred years of colonial regime, India was still bracketed as a third world state, and of course that was the era when the Cold War had started, and uh, we had the Western Bloc, we had the communist bloc, then we had the third world nations, a very strange concoction you know, in terms of the world order. And India was branded as a soft state. Uh, people like Guna Madal said that, you know, it doesn't have institutional capability to implement its own law. And um, renowned American economist uh, like uh, Professor J.K. Galbraith, who went on to become U.S. ambassador to India, People like him felt that uh, you know India is a functioning anarchy. How do we look at it? Certainly, heterogeneous identity was a very big issue. How to handle it? And gradually, there were also a lot of regional movements and subnationalist movement in terms of their aspiration level. How would their identity uh, get some kind of safeguard? Communities and linguistic group, um, you know, which were aspiring for some kind of reassurance and self-preservation. So Pandit Nehru faced a lot of uh, challenges. 
poverty, a dilapidated state structure, okay, in India, a lot of aspiration, many groups were aspiring for, uh, you know, recognition. That's where this entire debate of linguistic reorganization of state started, which was uh, an internal challenge, you know, in plain words. And what had happened, uh, foreign policy was something where one had to safeguard themselves between two blocks. And this entire debate of non-alignment uh, started, the Bandung conference and thereafter, why we have to preserve ourselves amidst two giants. You have two groups and uh, World War II ended, Cold War started and India was at crossroads. How do we define ourselves? How do we shape up a very viable, dynamic foreign policy which safeguards our interests? And in Indian context, the state was omnipotent and omnipresent. If you remember post-1991, we talk about LPG, liberalization, privatization, and globalization. Before that, it was the state which was the prime most actor. It occupied the center stage. It was omnipotent and omnipresent in the sense that distribution of goods and services as well as production was regulated and monitored by state where we have you know the dominance of public sector unit so that was the challenge if you ask a lot of internal challenges as i said heterogeneous identity how to keep everyone together then you also have a neighbor uh, who has not so far reconciled with the partition india had reconciled but pakistan feels that religion based uh, nationalism has to succeed Two nation theory has to be vindicated, but it also proved to be a failure with the emergence of Bangladesh. So, numerous challenges confronted India after independence. Uh, as you have uh, as you have uh, mentioned about non-alignment, uh, so I, I would like to ask you a question regarding that. So, uh, what are your uh, views regarding uh, uh, non-alignment? Uh, uh, following this principle of non-alignment uh, at the uh, at uh, uh, the time when the Cold War was uh, going on, I think th this uh, this provided an alternative to the third world countries uh, that uh, they they, could, they they can uh, remain uh, neutral. So, uh, how you view this uh, approach of India? Uh, how you view this India's approach of non-alignment uh, in that uh, phase, particularly? It's a very uh, important issue because um, there were people uh, I think I think uh, you are mute at the moment. Okay. Uh, what had happened, it's a very important issue since you had mentioned non-alignment. As I said earlier, India was at crossroads. Now, there was a gentleman who said, either you are with us or against us. And people like James, uh, you know, John Foster Dull said that um, non-alignment is immoral. You had a typical uh, discourse in the US and other parts of the world, especially the Western world, that you have to embrace what they claim, the new liberal economy and the democratic system, which is very, very Eurocentric. Now here the paradox is, see, every country has its own uniqueness in terms of having its foreign policy and uh, what you call uh, having institutions of governance in a democratic setup. And let me also emphasize non-alignment brought in range of uh, countries under its umbrella. Some had uh, you know, dictators, some had some were quasi democracy, some were democratic system like India. Now, you can't emphasize that democracy is, uh, you know, a universal phenomenon. Of course, it is taking time. And uh, what had happened is we have to understand that we can't afford to antagonize either of the bloc, whether it is a capitalist bloc under the stewardship of United States of America or the communist bloc under the former Soviet Union, the USSR. Now, the paradox here is 
how to maintain neutrality. It was not neutrality in generic sense. It was about principle neutrality and autonomy in our own foreign policy, that we would take decisions based on the merits of the case rather than to the line of any power. And that, in fact, vindicates the success uh, during Nehruvian era. We were able to get aid from the West as well as from the communist bloc. Now, coming back to non-alignment in terms of foreign policy, see, we have to understand what even uh, late former President Nixon of the United States had mentioned once upon a time, that foreign policy and domestic policy are like Siamese twins. They affect each other. Okay, so here we have to also look at the aspiration of our people, country which has just come out of colonialism. We have to build ties. We have to also ensure that South Asia has a very amicable environment. Let us not forget when we are talking about India, we are a subcontinental country. Okay, so we have ethnic groups which crisscross national boundaries. You have groups spread across India and Pakistan, India and Nepal, uh, India and Myanmar, India and Bangladesh. So in that case, we have to also have a foreign policy which is based on you know, secular, national, and inclusive with democratic interests. So these are very, very important yardstick. And NAM came, NAM as a policy was very appropriate, very timely under Pandit Nehru because it could safeguard our autonomy in foreign policy as well as uh, give us enough space to interact with various countries you know, on our own terms and conditions. So nothing is imposed from above. Whereas if you look, um, you know, the way Europe dealt with or um, Eastern Europe dealt with, you can't antagonize the superpower or the leader of your bloc. And they will try to bamboozle you in, um, you know, Czechoslovakia and other country where you had the pro-democracy movement, you had the Soviet tanks ruling it. Okay. And similarly, America had also up the ant whenever it felt that states under its banner of NATO or, uh, you know, or the Confederation of Democracies. I would rather say NATO because the military bloc was the guiding uh, force to keep everybody under its uh, umbrella. Yes. Uh, so, uh, as uh, we are discussing uh, that uh, about uh, India's uh, aspirations also, uh, as a global power. So uh, I would like to ask you that, uh, when did this uh, aspiration actually st uh, started for India that uh, we would like to become a global power? Uh, if you can, uh, if, if you can say a few words regarding this. And I think, uh, I think you have also got a presentation. I, I can see uh, in your screen. So uh, if you want to, if you want to highlight some point from there, also you can uh, do that. Oh, thank you. I would like to because uh, the questions you have raised are very important and certainly connected with the presentation, small presentation which I had made. So now what had happened since you had asked about what are the factors which uh, have brought in this change? Certainly, uh, Nehruvian era, as I said, it was an era of idealism, high level of idealism, implicit uh, trust, you know, uh, in foreign policy, faith that every country wants to have good relations, especially our neighbors. So there was no element of doubt. And of course, the Sino-Indian war was, uh, you know, a big shocker. It really uh, woke us up uh, out of the deep slumber which we were in. And that rather, that kind of event was a game changer. It promoted a kind of enlightened national interest wherein you look into the existing realities. So we could call the post Nehruvian era as an era which brought in this kind of change. We also realized that the policy initially for regional security. Okay, so what had happened, basically we had to protect our frontiers. Weapons came in from Soviet Union and we wanted to protect uh, our interests. So, 
it was south asia centric so all countries are primarily indo centric in terms of geography linkages so we were just defending ourselves because south asia was in turmoil as i said ethnic conflicts in sri lanka pakistan it's still struggling in terms of you know reconciling with its multiple identities the punjabi domination was quite evident in its army bangladesh emerged uh, because of the failure of two nation theory because linguistic nationalism could confront religious nationalism that is the outcome when we look at the independence movement of bangladesh the liberation of bangladesh so these factors certainly uh, put onus on india and india whether it likes it or not there is enormous responsibility on its shoulder the not only the international community looks towards india but everyone around india also looks towards india for uh, taking bold decisions to maintain stability in the region so what had happened now we are also looking at soft power we have started deploying soft power the last 10 15 years have been has been quite heavy especially from the era of vajpai late uh, former prime minister vajpai to the present uh, regime so which has been in power for the last 7 years the present government what has happened is soft power has been deployed it is we realize the importance of soft power when we talk about promotion of yoga promotion of indian cinema indian cuisines so and promotion of language like you know, classical language like sanskrit we realize that we have lot of uh, you know cultural symbols and they also add on to our power and here we must realize that what professor joseph nine had said that a country must have both soft power and hard power a judicious mix of both those element will make you a smart power so when we talk about foreign policy all these factors we are a civilizational state we are not a new state or a new nation state we just emerged we have thousands of years of history behind us in terms of our foreign policy our interaction with other parts of the world in that sense we are a civilizational state and we are an emerging power we had displayed our responsibility when it came to intervention in sri lanka to check the ethnic conflict to defend the then government in maldives you know uh, president mamoon uh, abdul gayu was facing threat there were some mercenaries who had gone from sri lanka and you know they tried to capture power in maldives and maldives opposed to only two nations united states of america and india so india could immediately respond and uh, you know take the situation under its control and uh, disarm the mercenaries and restore or safeguard the then bomb stable uh, polity you know our democracy speaks we need not defend anything our democracy is very inclusive you can also look at uh, what was sir aaron lipart talked about you know consociational politics yes different ethnic groups linguistic groups religious groups have been accommodated for example we had the separatist movement in mizoram things uh, you know the talks took place reconciliation happened and they were accommodated within the broader democratic framework sense of empowerment uh, we saw mr laldenga becoming the you know chief minister of mizoram so these are some example economy has mushroomed so what uh, of course we should acknowledge the role of late uh, prime minister narsimha rao because it was under his uh, leadership that the flat gates of economy was opened he realized that there is no adequate foreign reserve in our economy everything is depleting so what do we do so it was a very judicious uh, decision to open the flat gates of the economy and uh, of course trade and foreign policy are intertwined we can't separate them demographic dividend has also played a very important role uh, we must realize that india has the highest uh, number of young population okay young productive population which is uh, very beneficial for us and on one side we also see that uh, you know due to civil war the life expectancy rate is less in some countries 
and in some country fertility rate has come down especially in parts of europe in some country like japan you have aging population people in their 80s and 90s but to have a large scale young productive population is an asset for any nation so in indian context they will be beneficial in terms of the economy we have we can develop a very good human resource we can uh, and of course the it boom has also helped we are also pre, uh, you know producing large number of engineers apart from national institute of technology nit or iit indian institute of technology we have many technical institutes coming up dpo has mushroom so as less what has happened young productive population has also been supplemented or complemented by purchasing power you know indians purchasing power has also increased so in terms of access to goods and resources yeah incidentally a sociologist um, called lila fernandez had once said that uh, uh, what did she say yes she said that the middle class is uh, you know trying to nationalize the global products because the flow of goods and services economy is open and now the diaspora is emerging as a big force a lot of people going out of the country and visiting india so that has changed the dynamics apart from the historical factors which uh, you know uh, we discussed earlier that we have, we certainly pursue the bandian notion of non aggressiveness we have a non aggressive past even today it was only in retaliation okay in self defense so the balapur the surgical strikes or quite evident that we didn't uh, take any unilateral measure we just responded to you know uh, threats coming from across the border and we remain committed to universal peace and brotherhood okay and uh, we have always seen ourselves as part of the liberal democratic world order since the days of nehru so today as i said economy it gives uh, importance to ceilings india is on joint patrol with america you know uh, to check piracy drug trafficking so geo strategic concerns have emerged and uh, what has happened we also have to look at various factors today today we have to look at the power structure when you talk about foreign policy or any kind of qualitative shift what is the power structure in the present order how is international law being implemented and followed by all the members okay all the nation states how things are dealing with the present world order because as i said globalization we are also looking at issues concerning global governance so you need to have international orders uh, international organizations to be precise which looks into this aspect sovereignty of state is getting diluted by mutual consent it's not that our sovereignty has been diluted without our consent all nations by and large they have agreed that you know we have to look at alliances we have to check arms race so today why we are talking about quad we are talking because of the change in the region and now india you are not looking at india just because of the geographical location its size and population apart from you know the rich cultural history and various other factors how public opinion is shaped in india or how robust our leadership has been we are also looking at india more than a subcontinental country earlier till a decade ago we were thinking about india as a responsible south asian power which seeks to maintain stability and order in south asia region today when issues uh, emerge you know new developments happen especially what happened with china and uh, what happened in the last one and a half years in terms of the pandemic the vaccine diplomacy has started now india is very confident enough to look at itself in the indo pacific region okay so many things have happened which has shaped i talked about leadership just to show some images you know nam idealism which uh, yes i would also like to mention that panchil was also very relevant those days now certainly it depends on the current developments you know what are the actions around us based on that we will take it on
so uh, you are you you are talking about uh, India's uh, diaspora also. So I would uh, I would uh, like to ask you one question regarding this. Uh, um, uh, if has uh, India's approach uh, 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 towards the diaspora has uh, changed in recent times? What do you think? Yes. Uh, in fact, I would like to show an image of uh, Pravasi Bharatiya Divas which started uh, during the regime of uh, Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee, hmm. the first BJP government, which was uh, part of a broader coalition called NDA. Okay. Now, in fact, I just remembered uh, certain incidents when you asked this question about diaspora. What had happened when uh, late V.S. Naipaul won the Nobel Prize? Uh, Naipaul has written a very interesting uh, and to some extent, to some extent, very uh, controversial opinion too about India. He was undoubtedly one of the finest writer of our time, and uh, I'm saying controversial in the sense that it evoked uh, mixed reaction, sometimes extreme opinion too. And uh, he has uh, written, you know, he has written about India in three volumes, and it's a very fascinating account. Should we claim V.S. Naipaul as an Indian because he was somebody who was born in the West Indies and, uh, you know, who went to UK, United Kingdom, Britain. His opinion about India, is India a wounded civilization? Is it able to reconcile itself with the new order? Because while he said that, the amount of inequality, violence, challenges within and the history of, you know, invasion. Europeans, then uh, people from, uh, you know, Central Asia before that, what, how it has shaped India and how it is able to rise up, you know, respond to the history, historical events. So diaspora comes in as a very important stakeholder. Why? Because if uh, diaspora, let us not forget Gandhiji, who had been to South Africa, who returned to India and uh, actively mobilized people and galvanized the movement to attain independence. Now, diaspora becomes very important. Nehruvian era looked at diaspora as somebody who's of Indian origin, but who belongs to some other country or the country where they have settled down or where they were born. And Nehru said that, Pandit Nehru said that you have to reconcile yourself with the identity. So, in uh, other words, be loyal to your nation where you are born. It is not that uh, Indian diaspora's loyalty was ever questioned. What had happened is Indian diaspora has contributed immensely. You could look at it in two ways. Diaspora, people of Indian origin who were born and brought up in other countries, citizen of other country. And also, you could also, to some extent, look at our own NRI, non-resident India or Indian passport holder but working abroad for a couple of years or decades. They become, the diaspora becomes a very important stakeholder in foreign policy. And this is certainly what you call a paradigm shift, which happened under Prime Minister Vajpayee. Why? Because you realize that diaspora can also contribute to the development of their motherland or country of origin. So motherland for the NRIs, country of origin for people whose ancestors had migrated from India. So what happened? We realized that they can play a very vital role in India's development. They can also play a very vital role in their own countries, foreign policy and domestic politics. Today, you look at uh, the number of people who are of uh, Punjabi origin and they are successful in a country like Canada. You must have seen many turban people uh, being sworn in as a minister of the Canadian government which highlights the impact, you know, importance of diaspora. And this is also maybe to some extent uh, an age of transnationalism, that you just can't say that nationalism will be confined to territories. It could evoke a lot of sentiment around the world and you could have an age of transnationalism, which again uh, is as a result of globalization. Late Robin Cook, the former uh, foreign uh, secretary of the United Kingdom, he had given a very famous speech on uh, chicken tikka. 
and uh, people were amused, they were surprised, they were very pleased. And what was that? It was primarily to highlight the kind of multiculturalism which is evolving in in United Kingdom, that where chicken tikka from South Asia becomes an important cuisine to the extent that it can be even called as a national cuisine of United Kingdom, which again highlights the importance of diaspora. And uh, what has happened is now we have institutionalized through Pravasi Bharti Divas and uh, measures like um, OCI, PIO. What has happened? Diaspora, at least, you have an institutional mechanism of relating themselves with India. And uh, I don't think it should be seen in a negative light. It is not about being, uh, not being loyal to their uh, country, okay, where they were born and brought up. It is about trying to create a cultural identity that wherever you are, you carry a piece of India with you. And this applies the same, uh, you know, the same logic is applied when you look at the Jewish community. You talk about the Spanish speaking population. In fact, Spanish speaking population is more than in Spain itself. You look at Latin America, look, look at South America, the impact of you know, Spanish culture. Of course, they have a historic root to it in terms of the colonial rule by Spain and Portugal. But uh, now you have, uh, you have also had writers, uh, you know, Spanish writers from South America getting Nobel Prize, like Gabriel Garcia Marquez. So, uh, if we see uh, uh, after uh, after the 1962 war uh, between India and China, so uh, after that, India has uh, developed her uh, military capabilities. India has also. Uh, uh, developed uh, as a nation in terms of uh, uh, economy also. And uh, India is also uh, playing a, a great role in uh, world affairs today. So keeping all these uh, things in uh, view, my last question to you will be that, uh, can we still consider India as a third world country? Uh, very uh, interesting question because why I'd say interesting, many people, uh, especially, you know, on the sidelines of conference, uh, they are a little wary about this term, third world. Why are we talking about third world? India is a great country. Uh, you know, we are doing so well. We are getting Rafale aircrafts. We are moving into Pacific, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, we also have to understand there has been not only a qualitative shift, but we have also evolved over the last few decades. So what we are today, it didn't happen one fine day. It uh, took a lot of time. As I said earlier, the age of idealism of Nehru were, you know, disappeared. The moment we saw the liberation of Bangladesh, Indira Gandhi had to take very brave decisions, which also alienated uh, and rather antagonized people like Nixon, you know, the seventh fleet coming in and a lot of issues related to that. It's a big surrender. Then what happened? Regional security becomes uh, very important. Are you just a South Asian power or a country in terms of your geographical spread, in terms of having the second largest population in the world? Or are you something more than that? I mean, are we just looking at the face value? I think there has been a qualitative shift, not only uh, in terms of the technical sense of what you call the disappearance of Soviet Union, you know, the breakdown of Soviet Union paved way for American bloc to predominate, uh, to uh, dominate the world order. And see, that's a very ironical situation. From 1991 to 2001, America dominated, irrespective of whether it gets partner in various regions to you know, support its programs, support its initiatives, objectives. 9-11 happened, again, qualitative shift. We realized that no country can be an island in itself. It can't be self-sufficient. You have to have a fine coalition where you fine tune you know, your national interest, aspiration with other countries, national interests and objectives or you know, goals. 
and then create a security architecture which protects collective interests. And that happened after 9-11. So by then what had happened, India was also emerging during uh, the Narasimha Rao regime and thereafter, we were very categorical that we are not going to endorse, you know, the Eurocentric discourse on security. One of the finest moments was when uh, India's ambassador in the CTBT conference, uh, late ambassador Arundhati Ghosh, said that we are not going to sign CTBT because it is not in consonance with our national interests. How could uh, we sign some agreement which is rather self-destructive or to some extent suicidal? So that kind of movements which has happened, political shifts and actions, during uh, the regime of various leaders has certainly catapulted India out of that box. You know, it is no more a third world nation. You are looking at various issues. India established relations with Israel, the, you know, nuclear diplomacy, India got an ex exception or waiver, if you remember. What happened uh, under Manmohan, uh, former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh? We had the Indo-US nuclear deal. So these things certainly highlight that, you know, we are no more a third world state. And we are certainly an aspiring superpower. So which is uh, a very significant shift. And it is not any kind of jingoism. When we say we are no more a third world state, but an uh, aspiring superpower, there is no element of jingoism. Third world state. So what I was saying is now India is no more a third world state, not for the technical reasons that, you know, Soviet Union had disintegrated and a new world order emerged. People like Francis Fukuyama said that uh, it's end of history and the last man in the sense that the liberal order under American leadership is going to become universal everywhere across the world, you'll have only one kind of economic and political system. There is, so it is an end of history. And at the same time, what had happened, people like Samuel Huntington also talked about clash of civilization a little later. In fact, uh, the last work of Samuel Huntington was about the Hispanic threat to United States of America. Now, what has happened is movement of goods and services, okay? and uh, movement of people around the world in a globalized economy has also brought in a very positive impact in terms of the remittances sent by them to their motherland. That is a very important factor because I had mentioned about the diaspora. Now, India has also faced a qualitative shift. From 1991 to 2001, you had American dominance for more than a decade. Thereafter, 9-11 saw its power getting weakened and it also realized that it just can't dominate in a unilateral manner in which it used to earlier. So what was the outcome? The learning outcome was you had to involve big powers in different regions, whether it is you know, Japan, whether it is India, you have to bring them under a new security architecture and you have to ensure that national interest and security concerns are correlated with each other. All these countries, you have to have some kind of collective goals. You can't impose your individual national goals on the other country. So India emerged as a very responsible nation. Its intervention in Sri Lanka, its intervention in Maldives to save the then government uh, under Mamun Abdul Ghaim. So what had happened, Maldives had uh, approached India and the US at that time. So there has been a qualitative shift. Our refusal to sign CTBT agreement, because I still remember what late ambassador Arundhati Ghosh had mentioned, that you can't force any country to sign an agreement which is not in consonance with its national interest and security. So CTBT was one of the agreement riddled with Eurocentric discourse, you know, 
and uh, which was just considering eurocentric concern not about every country's individual concern national concern in terms of security our reluctance of the past was shed in terms of the ability to come out of what you call identity identity centric political discourse you know the domestic politics affecting foreign policy so we could leave those memories behind and establish relations with israel which was a very important decision of course the flat gates of the economy was opened and uh, the license raj vanished once we had omnipotent omnipresent indian state now we also have many non state actor around the world so in indian case you also see multinational corporations coming in media playing a very important role india enhancing what you call cultural diplomacy today we talk about vaccine diplomacy so india was able to realize the importance of you know soft power and hard power defense production acquisition of uh, latest uh, weapons today when it comes to armaments uh, you know we are trying to safeguard the skies through procurement of rafale aircrafts we are uh, trying to have aircraft carriers our nuclear submarines all these things establish uh, the fact that india is waking up to the new realities in terms of the new security architecture and india's responsibility as a major power is quite evident uh, in terms of its ability to take care of its citizens the recent uh, airlifting of citizens from afghanistan if you remember when the iraq kuwait war happened you know invasion of kuwait it was one of the biggest airlift after the second world war we were able to get indians out of kuwait we were also able to fly out various foreign nationals along with indian nationals so we are at the crossroad and uh, certainly that is a tag of the past when you say india as a third world state In the beginning i had mentioned about professor john kenneth galbraith you know terming it as functioning anarchy today we are talking about consolidation and uh, many things have happened we are able to involve uh, in negotiation involve uh, neighbors sometimes unruly neighbors as I said like pakistan and uh, we are able to take care of uh, what we call our interest when it comes to economic military ties and when it comes to advancing our own you know national interest that is there we have been able to consolidate ourselves hence we are one of the largest economy in the world we are in the top 3 top 4 economies of the world apart from the strategic autonomy which we exercise when it comes to our space program when it comes to securing our border today you must have also come across reports of the number of kilometers of road which are being laid every day so airfields are being activated old abandoned airfield are being activated it is not a kind of disengagement rather strengthening the border and certainly final thing diaspora has become important part of uh, our national discourse it's everywhere apart from you know the cinema which we watch various uh, language movies now diaspora is very much institutionalized playing a very positive role in uh, promoting india's goals and objective so the last image is howdy modi irrespective of uh, you know president trump not getting a second term uh, that is their internal affair uh, we could see that how india is able to capitalize on its strength uh so uh, you know uh, the uh, topic that we are discussing uh, today uh, is a very broad one and there are uh, many uh, aspects uh, are present over here uh, so i think uh, due to uh, shortage of time it is uh, not possible for us to cover everything uh, and uh, i would like to uh, i would like to arrange another program for you on this uh, topic so that we can uh, uh, continue this uh, discussion Uh, so uh, as today uh, we are uh, uh, very near to the end uh, so i have uh, got uh, another two questions from the students point of view as you know this uh, uh, program uh, is mainly uh, for the students uh, 
so uh, my uh, last two questions will be first the, uh, the first question will be that uh, uh, what are the questions that the students uh, can uh, expect uh, from this uh, topic and uh, the another question that uh, i would uh, like to ask you uh, is uh, if you can uh, if you can suggest some uh, books which uh, they can uh, uh, consult uh, for uh, for uh, gaining more knowledge uh, on this uh, topic yeah this is a very uh, important question firstly uh, many questions emerge when you look at uh, foreign policy uh, what has happened is uh, when we look at foreign policy there are many issues why diaspora is important for india and indian foreign policy how do we see india as a major power in south asia region yes and uh, the qualitative shift in india's uh, india's relations with its neighbor this is very important and how is india's trade relations again playing a very important role in india's foreign policy apart from diaspora we should also realize that indian companies are also doing well especially the companies related with information technology whether it is wipro uh, tcs uh, infosys and when you even talk about companies like tata who are doing well in automobile sector in various other country and uh, the story about uh, you know tata's interaction with the ford motors is legendary uh, we know what happened uh, and how tata maintained the position irrespective of the snub they received they stood firm on the ground without any vendetta so that's also very interesting uh, aspect when you look at it and when it comes to books uh, there are many books i could i can also email you uh, books uh, the list of books if you wish to i would say we can't ignore a important person like c raja mohan uh, his books on indian foreign policy who had served as a correspondent um, of the hindu newspaper in washington dc who is presently teaching in uh, i think national university of singapore we have uh, people like rajiv sikri former ambassador again his books are very important how he looked at it and uh, the also various other book uh, for example yeah so we have various other books if um, you want i can give you a list in terms of uh, kishan rana the former ambassador his books are also very important so he has uh, authored one book called 21st century diplomacy a practitioner's guide you have uh, you know namrata goswami has edited uh, the book india's approach to asia strategy geopolitics and responsibility uh, of course uh, our professor rajkumar kotari has edited a book on india in the new world order the changing contours of foreign policy under narendra modi that is important challenge and uh, strategic rethinking uh, you know so in india's foreign policy was a work by uh, ambassador rajiv sikri that is a very interesting work if you talk about the latest work in the last 4 5 years i have also come across uh, aparna pandey's book uh, from chanakya to modi evolution of indian foreign policy that is also a very important work so there has been a uh, couple of uh, writers have done well uh you know professor harsh pant has written about indian foreign policy and overview uh our good old friend in uh, bips uh, uh, professor devashish nandi you know his book on uh, his, he has also written couple of books one of the book which i immediately recollect is mapping uh, south asia state society and security dilemma that's very important so uh, there are range of books if one has to look at it many and of course i would also suggest apart from books because see foreign policy is a very vibrant and fluid subject the textbooks also become outdated after a point of time 
So it's better that we also enhance our uh, knowledge and information through various journal articles. And newspaper articles and editorials have their own relevance, but journal articles are very important in terms of the research inputs which we get. So, uh, Professor R. Radhakrishnan, uh, I would like to thank you on uh, behalf of Bengal Institute of uh, Political Studies uh, for being with us. Uh, and uh, I would, uh, so today we are ending our uh, uh, program over here. Uh, I would uh, request uh, all the viewers uh, to uh, like uh, the YouTube channel of uh, uh, Bengal Institute of Political Studies and also to subscribe uh, this channel. And uh, if you have got any uh, queries or if you want to uh, give your feedback, you can just post it uh, in the comment box. Uh, so with this, uh, we are ending uh, today's program. Uh, thank you. Thank you.